Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. It is good to be with you all this morning in the house of the Lord. I'm excited to be here. Uh, if you are here for the first time visiting, my name is Eric. I'm the pastor here, and we are very glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, we hope that you have been made to feel welcome, and we hope that you receive a blessing from the Lord this morning. Uh, if you would, I'd like you to stand with me as I read from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. And this is the Word of God. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. Let's pray. Oh God, You are indeed faithful. God, I, uh, I look forward so much to preaching about Your grace over these next few weeks. God, this morning, would You fill this room with Your Spirit? God, would You do a work in our hearts that we would be reminded of Your goodness, of Your mercy, and the compassion that You've given us in our lives. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are justified by Your grace as a gift. So this morning as we worship You, Lord, I pray that You would draw our hearts near to You, that You would remind us of that grace, and that we would worship You well as a people. We love You. We praise You. We give You thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful to be with you today. Thank you all for being here. Let's sing our doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone say, Holy is the Lord. For the joy of the Lord is our 
strength We bow down and worship Him now How great and how awesome is He And together we say Seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they called to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Falling from the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. We're singing, You are holy. Oh, oh, oh. 
Amen. You may be seated. As we come a time of communion this morning, uh, in my reading this week, I came across this because uh, for some reason this week, Pastor Eric ran across my mind, and I know that uh, the book of Romans is his favorite book, and so I was thrumming, thrumming through some of my stuff, and this popped up to me this morning, that, well, it was actually Monday morning, about 5.15, I don't know, I don't know why, but sometimes you, you come across things that just cause you to stop and think, and Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it says, You see, at just at the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. This is what struck me real hard this week. Just stop for a minute and listen, because we're at a time of meditation and I want you to really meditate on this verse. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Just listen one more time. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we are so unworthy of what the act that was done. The fact that you sent your only son to this earth to walk a, a sinless life, but yet die. One of the most horrific, torturous deaths that anybody could die for someone else. Father, we know that we're sinners, but this morning as we partake of this communion, we get to participate in this because you allowed your son to die. Father, we're so grateful for that. And we pause this morning to, uh, to ask you to forgive us of our sins when we do fall short. And thank you for loving us. And it's the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray and ask these things. Amen.
Thank you, Sandy. Well, it is a good day. It's a good day. I got a very special family visiting with me today. The, this is Tom Gray in front of us. I know he likes to be called out, but Tom was one of the men that the Lord used to lead me to him. So uh, it's a grace to have him and his family with us today. So many times in my life, I should have gotten in trouble for things that I have done or not done. Growing up in grade school, I would procrastinate. All right, I'll just confess, I still procrastinate. But I would wait until the very last hour or moment to do an assignment or to study for a test. And sometimes I would just forget, but most of the time, I just didn't want to do the work, so I would wait until the very last minute. And my grades always reflected that, no surprise. When I was in grade school, I had a teacher named Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark was a man's man, at least he was to me. He had an odd combination of Old Spice and Camel Studs that just came out of him. I don't know what it was. <clears throat> he ate roll he ate, he ate Rolaids, that's tongue twister, like they were candy. Just one after another during class be popping Rolaids. And I'm like, man, that can't be good for you. In his shirt pocket, he had his Camel Studs and he had a black fine tooth comb. And he'd be teaching history. He was a t history teacher. And as he was teaching history, he would pause, pull the comb out, and just start slicking his white hair back. I mean, the dude was old. Like, he was old, old. Like, snow, I better stop. I'm snow white hair. The first 20 minutes of class... He would make us take our assignment that he would give. Every day we'd have an assignment. He would give this assignment. We'd have to pass it around to the people that were sitting next to us. Every day, same story. I knew what was coming every day. You learn a few things, though, over time. Who your real friends are. I would hand this paper to somebody, to my right or to my left, in front or behind. And every now and then, I'm not proud of this, but every now and then, depending on who it was that I would pass my assignment to, I would uh, maybe have the wrong answer, or maybe have not even answered the question. And the person that I would hand my homework to, maybe they would help a brother out, fill something in for me, maybe change what I did wrong. not proud of that. But I remember the first time... The first time, again, I'm not proud of this, there was multiple times, but the first time that I did this and I got caught, I knew I was caught. Like, I was, uh oh, I knew, I knew I was caught. I knew that I was going to get an F on this assignment, I'm going to definitely get a zero, and he was definitely, definitely going to call my parents. When Mr. Clark, on this particular day, calls me and my friend after class. And he just looks at me, and he says, don't do it again, or there will be trouble next time. Do you understand me? To which I was like, uh, yeah. Yeah, got it. In one instant, one instant, just like this, I was given grace. Grace because he didn't tell my parents like he should have. At the same time, I was also given mercy because whatever the grade I got on that assignment, I don't remember what it was. That's not what I deserved. I deserved the F. I probably got like a C minus. I don't know if it. It wasn't any higher than a C, I can tell you that much. When I left that brief meeting, 
I remember I, wiping the sweat off my brow and thinking, praise Jesus, I'm going to actually live through this day. But I remember looking back now, I was given something that day that I didn't fully understand. I was given grace. Grace is a beautiful thing. Amen? We all need grace. We need it every day. We need it moment by moment to get through the day. Grace is all around us. Like most things in life, we take grace for granted. We don't appreciate it nearly enough. Many times, if we're honest, we don't like to extend it to people either, do we? Grace is a Bible word. It's a word that's used in both Old and New Testament. When we think of grace, we typically think of this definition, and I think it's a good one and a right one. Grace can be defined as unearned or unmerited favor. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. We'll talk about that in the coming weeks. But grace is unmerited favor. That's a good definition. But maybe it's not a complete definition. Let me read you this from the Baker's Encyclopedia of the Bible. Grace is the dimension of divine activity that enables God to confront human indifference and rebellion with an inexhaustible capacity to forgive and to bless. God is gracious in His actions. Not only does God extend grace, but He extends it continually. God by nature is gracious. It's one of His many attributes. It's a part of who He is. There's never a moment that God is not gracious. There's never a moment where He ceases to be gracious. We see the grace of God from the very beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve eat the fruit. They break the only commandment that God had given them. Instead of ending everything right at that moment, He doesn't. He finds them hiding. Adam and Eve are hiding in the garden. Adam peeks his head out from around a bush. And he tells God, he says, I heard you in the garden. I heard you calling for me. I knew you were looking for me. But I was afraid. Because I was naked. And the funniest verse in the Bible to me, God says, who, who told you you were naked? I want you to think about this for a minute, Okay. You go back just a few verses before that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. This is what we read. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Why is that verse in there? Why, Why did Moses... Why did God want Moses to put that verse in the Bible for our benefit? The word naked in the original in the original Hebrew it means um, naked. I mean it does. It's lightly dressed to have no barrier. Adam and Eve were naked. They were naked and they didn't even think about it. It wasn't awkward to them. It wasn't weird. They had nothing to be ashamed of. They hadn't done anything wrong. 
But the moment that they ate the fruit, it's like, bam! We're caught. Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloth. They tried to cover themselves up. So they sin and they, they break God's one commandment. And immediately, they realize we're totally exposed here. For the first time in their lives, everything is revealed. And they're humiliated. So what do they do? They, they, tr- they, try, they try to hide themselves. They try to cover up their nakedness. Think, think about your life for a moment. How many times when, when you sin, how many times when you feel like you're going to get caught, you get convicted through the Spirit, you want to come clean, but you don't because you can't handle what it's doing to you inside. So you try to cover it up. You try to hide the sin that's in your life. Because you know it's wrong and you're ashamed of it. See, sin has this way of of humiliating us. Sin has its way of, of exposing us for who we really are. When David slept with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, what did he do? He, he tries to cover it up, right? Didn't work. See, the idea of our sin being revealed is, is terrifying. Or it should be. It's humiliating. No matter how hard we try to keep our sins hidden, eventually, guess what? They'll be revealed. The Bible is full of warning passages about our sin not being hidden in the eyes of God. Let me walk you through some. Psalm 44, verses 20 and 21, if we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For He knows the secrets of the heart. Psalm 69, verse 5, O God, You know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from You. Psalm chapter 90, verse 8, You've set our iniquities before You, our secret sins in the light of Your presence. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 17, For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from Me, nor is their iniquity concealed from My eyes. How about out of the words of the mouth of Jesus? Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Jesus says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Finally, from the writer of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him whom we must give account. 
Now, if I just, if I just left, left you there, now, all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him whom we must give account. If, if that was all that I, if I just stopped this sermon right there, then some of y'all would go home feeling pretty gloom and doom. The writer of Hebrews was to just stop at verse 13. And those words have a lot of weight to them, do they not? Thankfully, what we read next is so comforting. Verse 14, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How incredible is that verse? The beauty of grace and the sweetness of grace is that no matter what you have done in your life, no matter how great or how small the sin might be, God requires, all that He requires is that you approach His throne in repentance and faith. And if you notice, that throne is not a throne of condemnation. It is a throne of grace. God has always given grace to the humble and the contrite of heart. 1 John 1.9, we read this, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some of us here this morning, we have sin in our lives that have all but crippled us from being the people that God has called us to be. The thought of being naked and exposed before God is terrifying. At least it is to me. And probably to you too. The problem is is that the thought of confessing those sins to God and getting the sin out in the open is what's even more terrifying in some ways is because in our minds, we think that we can deal with God later. But if we confess these things right now and we expose the sin that somehow... We won't have to deal with the people that we know that this sin that we're living in is going to hurt the most. So we keep it inside of us. We hide our sin so that no one knows. Shame we feel. The consequences of our actions We keep it hidden and so confession it becomes harder and harder, does it not? The longer that we keep it hidden, the greater the chance we think that it will just go away. The problem with sin is that it has a way of building in us. What starts with a temptation, it festers inside of us and it builds and it builds and we keep feeding it until one day it takes 
control of our lives and ultimately it destroys us. We don't think of the consequences of it, but it's not just us that our sin affects. It affects those around us. Probably those that mean the most to us. James says it like this in James 1, 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. And then desire, when it gives, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. Now I want to go back to the garden and Adam. Wages of sin, the cost, the consequences of sin is death. Adam and Eve have realized that they've sinned. They've, they've realized that they're naked, that they're exposed, they're ashamed of what they've done, and so they, fi- they sew fig leaves together to cover themselves and to cover their nakedness. They hide from God. What they'd done was break God's one commandment. And God had warned them that on the day that you eat of this fruit, on this day, you will surely die. But that's not what happened. They didn't die instantly. It was 900 and something years later. God could have destroyed them instantly. And everything else. But instead of wrath, He shows mercy. Gives them grace. Was there punishment for sin? Yes, absolutely. There's always consequences for our sin. Either sin is paid for by the sinner, or sin is paid for by the Son. They're sent out of the garden. This place of perfection that God had created. It was good, it was very good. can't be here anymore. There's sin out of the garden. Everything's cursed. Death has entered into the world. Sin has entered into the world. But just before they leave the garden, this is what we see. Genesis 3.21 The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife Garments of skins and clothe them. We typically don't pay attention to the minor details when we read the Bible. Most people read this portion of Scripture and and they only see the cursing, the removal from the garden. They only see that strange cherubim that stands in the garden with a flaming sword. This verse is so important because we see God's grace. God clothes them. They had tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves. But before they leave the garden, God says, I'll clothe you. In order for Adam and Eve to be clothed So their nakedness could not be seen. A sacrifice had to have been made. That word, garment, it literally means leather or animal hide. Animal sacrifice would be a prominent theme for the people of God. 
Although the blood of animals and the sacrifice of animals were never meant to take away sin, they were shadows of an ultimate reality that would be revealed in Jesus Christ who would come and make that once for all time sacrifice for sins. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God, the great High Priest, Jesus, who purchased all those who believe in Him with His own blood. And here is the wonderful part. When you come to Jesus, and when you believe in Him, you believe in His work, and when you're you're baptized, Paul tells us in Galatians, that when you're baptized, that in our baptism, that Christ clothes us. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. To put on, in the literal translation, it means to be clothed. Clothed in what? Clothed in Christ. In His righteousness. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. God's grace has been evident from the very moments of the fall. Adam and Eve sinned against God. They broke His commandment. Instead of ending their lives in that moment, He allows them to live. Instead of leaving them naked and exposed to roam through the world, He clothes them. Through a sacrifice. Everything that happened in the fall of Adam, as devastating as the effects were, and they were devastating, and we don't need to look any farther than this room to see the devastating effects of sin. Everything that was wrong in the first Adam. is finally and forever made right in the second Adam. In Jesus Christ. Let me show you this from Scripture. Did I tell you that Romans was my favorite book? Okay, just checking. Romans 5. I want you to be mindful of all of the ways that Christ makes things right. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance 
of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. The disobedience of Adam brought sin. It brought death. It brought judgment. It brought bondage. It brought condemnation to the whole world. When Adam sinned, death came into the world and he says that it reigned like a king throughout the world. The way that you knew that everybody was a sinner was why? Because they were dying. From the time of the fall to the time of Christ, death reigned in the world. Jesus Christ came. And at the cross... When he dies, three days later when he comes back to life, death has no sting. Where death had ruled and reigned in the world, he, Christ, replaced it with grace. Grace through His righteousness. Now, instead of getting what we deserve, we get, instead of death and separation, instead of being naked and exposed for who we are, We get eternal life and endless blessing. And that, my friends, is unearned favor. There's nothing that you bring to the cross of Christ except your sin. And by faith, there's nothing that you get at the cross of Christ except forgiveness and mercy. Now here's, this part is truly amazing to me. I think all of the negative effects of the fall of the first Adam are done away with in the work of the second Adam, who's Christ. Sin and death are defeated. The, the problem is, is that we still see the effects of sin. Right? Still this lingering of sin in our lives. I mean, we're Christians, and yet every single day we still battle sin in our own lives. As hard as we try to overcome Temptation usually gets its way. I want you to notice this in verse 20 of the passage that I just read. Paul says, The law came to increase the trespass. That the reason that God gave the Ten Commandments was to show the people of Israel this is how bad you really are. To increase. I know what adultery is. Now it's even worse because I know what it is and I'm still doing it. 
But these words, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. As, dif- as difficult as it is to believe, church, the, the amount of sin that's in your life will always and forever be outmatched by the amount of grace that's offered to you in Jesus. Paul says in Romans 8, he says there's, that there's nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love of Christ. And one of the things that he mentions is, guess what? It's nakedness. There's nothing in all of creation that separates the sinner from the Savior. But hear this warning. Grace will always be given to the sinner who approaches the throne of grace by faith and repentance. But do not use grace as a way of condoning sin. We are called to fight against our sin. Daily. It's a daily battle. Paul says, I beat my flesh into submission. We fight our sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. And grace is there when you're struggling against your sin and you fall into it. But grace is never to be used as an opportunity to sin. Paul says, are we to continue sinning so that grace can abound? And then he uses the strongest no in the Greek language. Me genoita. May it never be. Whatever you're fighting today, whatever struggle you are having in sin, Whatever you've done, whatever sin you've not confessed, my prayer is that today you would approach God's throne of grace, that you would come to Him in repentance and faith, and that you would trust in the work of Jesus Christ. Confess your sins, repent, and turn away from them. Grace is one of those amazing things. That only those who have seen how bad they really are can look to Jesus and feel how marvelous and wonderful it is to be given something else. There's nothing that you will ever do to earn grace. It is a free gift given to you in Jesus Christ. Over these next few weeks, as we try to unfold and unpack grace throughout the Bible, I pray that you would see the amazing Abundant grace that is offered to you in Jesus Christ. And if you do not know Him, I pray that this would be the time that you would find Him. Jesus says, come to Me. All you who are weary and heavy burdened, come. And I'll give you rest. He gives us rest by giving us grace in our lives. So I hope that you will find that. Let's pray. God, though our sins are like crimson, You make them white as snow. All have sinned and fall short of the glory 
of God. But we are justified by grace and through faith in you. Grace. You pour it out on us richly. God, would we be ever mindful of how gracious you really are. You are a wonderful, merciful, loving, faithful high priest. We give you praise and we give you thanks for who you are. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, if you have any decisions, any prayers, any sin that you've not confessed that you want, this is the time to do that. I'll be standing over here and Don't leave today without tasting the grace that's offered to you in Christ. I love you guys. Let's stand and let's sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace In every heart and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone, Christ alone, we make strong in the Savior's love. Who the storm, He is alone, Lord of shall come with trumpet sound Oh, may I there in Him be found Just in His righteousness alone For us to stand before the throne
Praise God. Praise God for His grace. You can be seated for just a moment. Just a few things by way of announcements. Um, just want to remind the elders that tomorrow, 1 o'clock, uh, we will have our elders meeting. Um, Monday night Bible study on the book of Revelation starts back tomorrow night. Uh, if you haven't been to uh, our study yet, I encourage you to come tomorrow. We're just going to be doing a review of the things that Jesus has revealed about Himself through the Apostle John to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Um, and so it'll be a good time for you to join uh, before we leave reality and go up to the throne room of heaven and get confused. So um, I encourage you to come to that. We have Monday night, 6.30. We have our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, where are you at now? Ezekiel. Praise God for the prophets. Um, so Monday nights, Wednesday nights, Saturday at 9 o'clock, uh, Heidi's brunch. So women, be there, 9 a.m. It'll be good for your soul. I'm thankful for that. Am I forgetting something else? Uh, we are still in need of a children's Sunday school teacher. Um, and so uh, if you have thought about teaching our young kids uh, or would possibly be interested in that, I would like you to come and talk to me. Um, there are a lot of ways for you to get involved. Um, I think that's it. Did I leave anything out? Anybody else have any? 